Those of you who helped with the wedding, I hope you had a good day yesterday. We had a great time here at the wedding. We had a very, very enjoyable day. And uh, day started off, um, the day started off, I went and visited a guy that uh, came here. Some of you heard me tell the thing. This guy just walked in, surprised me, and said, I want to accept Jesus and ask him into my heart to save me. I said, hi, I'm Isaac. Good morning. <laughs> I said, how many times have you done that before? Zero. I said, why do you want to get saved? So I go to heaven? Okay, so far, that's all the right answers. <laughs> uh, so you understand you're a sinner? Oh, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm ready to get saved. So I, he got saved, like, right there. And then uh, I visited him yesterday morning, and he said, we, it was all awkward because I was painting, and he was surprising me. And... Uh, <laughs> And I, I knocked on his door. He's, he said, can I help you? I said, I'm the guy that you might not recognize me. I'm dressed a little different. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I want to let you know, before you say anything, I want to let you know I had, the mo- I had the sincerest intentions the other day when I, got, when I came to talk to you. And he's for real. He's, he's, uh, he said he'd be here at church next week. He's, he had a friend die that was close to him, and then he saw somebody get very, very sick from COVID, and then he got the shot and got very, very sick himself, and that got him thinking about death, got him scared about where he's going when he died, so he wanted to get saved. And, uh, man, sometimes you know it, and sometimes, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you wonder, but, boy, no question with that guy. His name is Marcel, if you want to pray for him, M-A-R-C-E-L. And then uh, we had the wedding yesterday. That went well. Race preached, I preached, I think Curtis preached a little bit there, <laughs> and, uh, and then we gave the invitation about 15 times, if you want to get saved, I got to lead some of the Lord last night in my office, so, it was a good day, so if you just got saved last night, this song is for you, number 466, 466, let's stand and sing, Christ liveth in me.
gathered here together. Uh, thank you for a very eventful week and all the things that took place there. Again, thank you for the people that helped from this church and contributed uh, a lot of their time and money and effort to that. Lord, I thank you. I ask you bless them for that. Lord, thank you for being able to gather here this morning. Lord, in like-mindedness uh, around your word, I ask that you please bless it. I ask that you bless the preaching this morning, and more importantly, what you would speak to individual hearts about today. I ask that there would be a sweet spirit here, and that you'd be welcome to meet and sit amongst our midst. And Lord, I ask that you please uh, help us to go out from here today, having heard from you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How about number 446? 446, just back a couple pages. 446, satisfied. <laughs> Taking everything down, yes. loading the Jude said that rain was a blessing. <laughs> to get everybody cleaned out. Got there. everybody up and moving, and the table got pulled, and chairs got yep. pulled away. That was, like that. that was the Lord saying, "You're done. Wrap it up." This yep. is the right time. Yep. 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 Yes, sir. Number seventy. Number seventy. Number seventy, Number 70 in the blue book. All right. Let's see if this one's more familiar to everybody. Holy, holy, holy. Number seventy. <laughs> Thank you. 
this other book, the green book. And this is what this second verse is about. You got a green book in front of you? This isn't just some pretty painting or ugly chalk drawing somebody did. This is a scene in heaven as described in Revelation. Oh, what is that? Revelation 4? 14? It's got a 4 in it, I'm pretty sure. This is the elders there before the throne casting their crowns at Jesus' feet. And that's what this second verse is about. One day you're going to be there, you're going to see this. And you're going to be there, and you're going to see this scene before you're, and you're going to say, man, I thought those Baptists were crazy shouting, and the Pentecostals were crazy hollering, and uh, you're going to get to heaven and hear some amens like you never heard in a Presbyterian church in your life. You're going to hear some shouting and some singing. You're going to hear some people praising God, and I think a lot of Christians uh, are, I think a lot of people in those churches are saved. They're going to be in heaven, and they're going to say, what in the world have I gotten myself into? I've never experienced a thing like this in my entire life. Uh, verse 2, that's what this verse is about, on the second. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Okay, announcements. Good morning. Uh, I don't have any. Wait, there's a couple. Uh, we have the pottery ministry coming September 1st, which is just a couple days from now. And that'll be Sunday and then Wednesday. No, wait. It'll be Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, so. Um, It'll be here starting, of course, on Wednesday. It'll be at uh, 6 o'clock. And then uh, Friday, it's all at 6? Yep. 6 o'clock each night. Let's see. And Sunday regular services, right. And uh, let's see. Is there anything else? I know I'm missing stuff. Oh. <laughs> This one. What? Laugh at me. You'll get old one day. Then you'll find out. Potluck fellowship. It says fiesta, but I'm not so sure. We had a number of of uh, lasagnas left over. So lasagna. That's kind of fiesta. What? Oh, fiesta. Right. Oh, fro so a month from now, because <clears throat> it says, okay, got it. So, Fellowship Fiesta, south of the board. Don't laugh at me, girls. <laughs> really? Seriously. Anyway, Fellowship Fiesta, south of the border, Mexican food, this next potluck, which is September 5th. Uh, David Elsie, you got that one. Thanks for help. Keep praying for the aces. Yes. 
Aces. Ace squared. Race and grace. And uh, uh, we have question and answer cards. They're uh, colored cards over here. If you have a question on the Bible, fill that out. You can put your name on it if you want. And then uh, Pastor Isaac will answer those in the afternoon Sunday service. Um, and then the last thing is Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, we have Bible study here. And uh, 5.30, some people show up with food um, if you'd like to join in the meal. Any questions or anything added? Please pray for all the people in um, the Gulf that are going to be affected by Ida. My, my nephew is one of the people who has to remain in Monty. And he is on the bed. I'm like, right there, where it's going to hit. Where it's going to hit. Yeah, and the, the wind's going to be blowing. Uh, so, yeah, pray, pray, for, pray for all that. And... Uh, and uh, we'll see what God is going to be doing to this nation and all this stuff going on. Of course, it, this is not, there's nothing new. Hurricanes hit every year, and tornadoes hit every year, and earthquakes hit. So this, there's nothing new under the sun in uh, our society or in, in the weather. So, let's try it. And keep, keep the aces in prayer specifically for finding a place to stay down there. I just talked to somebody that lives there, and they said everybody from Panama City got kicked out of Panama City by a hurricane, so they all moved to Pensacola, and there's no places to rent. So I need to pass that along to them, and they're trying to figure out whether they should tow a camper down or find a place, and uh, so everything is a little difficult for that. You're not going to choose to do what the Lord wants you to do and it just be roses and sunshine and gumdrops. It's going to be you setting your face to do what the Lord asks you to do and then expecting <laughs> expecting the devil to hinder you. Um, so we got some question and answer tonight. If you put a question in the box today and you're only here today and you come back tonight, I'll put it at the top of the list and try to answer it tonight. we got some questions. Uh, otherwise, if we get to them, uh, what's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? That's been on my desk for quite a while. We're going to answer that tonight. It's a very simple answer, but I think it's a good answer. Uh, somebody had a question about 2 Corinthians 12 about Paul's revelation. Uh, what are the revelations talk, Paul's talking about? Being in the body, I cannot tell out of the body. And why does he have uh, Satan buffeting him? And what is that thorn? What is that thorn in his flesh? We'll cover that tonight. Uh, Lord willing, at 2.30. If someone, this is a good question. If someone may have been saved even if it was only for a day, are they going to heaven? That is an excellent, excellent question, excellently phrased. And there's a reason that they phrase it that way, because somebody's teaching it a certain way for them to think that. How do you explain to someone who isn't saved that they need to fear God? Another excellent question. So we might not have time for every one of those, but uh, that's what we're looking forward to in Sunday afternoons. If the questions ever stop, we'll get back to the book of Matthew. Um, but I don't mind doing the Q&As. I think uh, I've enjoyed those as much or more as verse by verse. Uh, and of course, Wednesday night, we're going to rearrange everything again. So apologies today for those of you who didn't see the rearrangement and came into a new <laughs> church building almost. Uh, we might leave it similar, but we're going to open up this front area for the pottery ministry and uh, set it up for Wednesday night. So if you can make it to that, I think it'll be a real blessing. It's like show and tell to the hundredth degree. It's, um, it's a pottery uh, shop basically set up here in church uh, with, with application, Bible teaching, and then preaching uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So uh, I've heard, this, uh, I've heard uh, this speaker before about eight years ago and it was excellent, and I can only imagine he's gotten better uh, in the last eight years uh, traveling around the country doing this. I've heard from two other preachers that said it was very, very good at their church uh, west of us over in Montana, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, if you would, turn in your Bible to John chapter 16. John 16. We'll get into the lesson tonight. I'm going to be in verse 33 in just a moment. John 16 and verse 33. Before I read that verse, I need to tell you where we are in the scriptures. We're in the book of John. Uh, as Emma says, this is the first John, not first John. 
So in your Bible, you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, but those are later. The 1st John comes later. It's just how it is. You just got to figure it out. This is called St. John or just simply John. It's, it's the last of the four Gospels, fourth book in the New Testament. So look at John chapter 16, and while you're turning there, uh, let me give you some background. In chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, those four entire chapters are Jesus' last words to his disciples. So you get four solid chapters of direct dialogue, conversation with Jesus Christ and Him telling them, I'm going to go away, and they don't understand. And He says, I'm going to go away. And they say, you can't go away. And He says, I know that you're sorrowful because I'm going away, but I'm going away. And they still don't get it. (laughs) They just cannot accept that we have taken three, three years, three and a half years to believe that you are who you say you are. And now as soon as we figure that out, you're going to leave us. And Jesus says, yes, that's what's going to happen. And Peter draws, pulls a sword and chops people's ears off and says, no, you're not. And he's very adamant about it. And the Lord says, yes, I am. And you're not going to go against the word of the Lord. And you get down to chapter 16, and I just want to focus on one thing that he said there. Chapter 16, I want to preach on this one verse here today. Uh, verse, chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus is speaking to the disciples Throughout the chapter, he says these things seven times. This is the seventh time he says these things. In verse 33, I have spoken unto you that in me, this is the application, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want to preach today on some things a Christian should cherish. Things a Christian should cherish. Lord, again, we come to you. I'm um, asking for your help with this message, Lord, I'm asking for your help uh, in other people's understanding. Lord, we know that you are the author of this book, and without your help and without your Holy Spirit's guidance and light on the scriptures, there's no way that we can understand these words that uh, the world has found fault with and that many Christians uh, do not understand and people change them and people go to great lengths to study other languages and other sources to understand them. and. Lord, I think that it's as simple as talking to you and asking for your help, and so we're asking for that now. Lord, I ask that you help me to take these words and this verse especially and apply them to us today that we could uh, grow and come into a perfect knowledge of you and uh, be formed into your image, like you said, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. In uh, the counseling we had with the ACEs this past couple weeks, um, I... I had them read a few places in scripture together on their own time and I gave them one other assignment. I gave them the assignment of memorizing a definition. I know you thought I was going to say some verses, but I gave them the assignment to memorize some definitions out of a dictionary. I had her memorize the definition to the word submit and the word reverence. And over there in 1 Peter chapter 3, it tells the wife to submit like Sarah submitted. And the context is in First Peter 3 is Abraham's doing something wrong and Sarah still submits to him, calling him Lord. And the Lord blesses the situation. In spite of Abraham screwing up, in spite of Abraham lying to a king and telling him that she's my sister and she wasn't his sister, Sarah submitted to Abraham in that matter and the Lord protected her and the Lord blessed them because of it. Do you know the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament? Do you know his character? Some Christians think that God's just got a hammer. He's waiting to bop you on the head anytime you take a misstep. And God's not like that. God expects you to mess up. And he's looking for one thing in your life. He's looking for humility and repentance. God's just looking for you to say, I screwed up again, Lord. I did something wrong. Would you please forgive me? And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. If you try to live the Christian life and try to be the perfect little Christian, you're going to be a Pharisee and nobody's going to want to be around you, including the Holy Spirit. (laughs) You're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. And you know what Abraham did? Abraham sinned, and the Lord rebuked him for it, and the king rebuked him for it, and God blessed him and blessed their relationship and blessed their marriage because Sarah understood when and how to submit. Uh, Also, to reverence. To reverence. That's quite a definition in the dictionary. Some of you wives should look that up. Reverence is a term we use for God. Holy and reverend is his name, and you're supposed to reverence your husband. One day my wife came to me, and I, we had gotten in this argument, one of, one of just a couple arguments over the years, and she came to me, and I, and, uh, or I came to her. I said, uh, I want you to tell me from the Bible. I want you to show me from the Bible what I'm doing wrong. I thought I really had a good, 
good position there. <laughs> Real solid stand. And uh, so she came back about a half hour later, and she said, how do you honor me? And you know like when the Holy Spirit's speaking, but you hear it from somebody's voice sometimes? <laughs> You're like, was that you, Lord? Like, that sounded like my wife's voice, but I think that was you. I went back to the dictionary and looked up honor and every single definition. I said, I don't measure up to that. I don't measure up to definition 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 2C. I don't measure up to any of this. I got preached out out of a dictionary by the Lord, <laughs> by my wife, by the Holy Spirit from this book. And I had Race uh, look up the word honor and memorize what honor meant find that in Ephesians chapter 5 and you find another verse there about honoring or about in Ephesians 5 about cherishing no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it every man knows how to take care of himself so if you women don't know this is how we take care of ourselves we go to shields and we buy a gun that is how we <laughs> cherish ourselves or we buy a new knife because the last knife was about to wear out and it wasn't worn out yet but we got a new knife because this one looks better and cuts faster. <laughs> we know how to cherish ourselves, but do you know how to cherish your wife? And you look up the definition of cherish in the Bible. Cherish means to tenderly care for. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. The Lord cherishes you. I want to talk about some things this morning that a Christian should cherish, but the Lord cherishes you. and You cherish your flesh, but you're commanded to cherish your wife, and you're commanded to cherish some other things in Scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 4, or 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 4, it's kind of a strange story in the Old Testament. David there is getting old in age, and they didn't have plug-in heated blankets, and so they brought a woman of the palace, and they put her with him to keep him warm. And one of the definitions of cherish means to keep warm, to give ease to. The damsel is very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. There's no relation there, but she kept him warm, and that's one of the definitions. It's an archaic Middle English definition of cherish. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul said, We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Something I've had to learn in the ministry, and I'm still learning, is how to be like a nurse. I don't think of myself as a nurse, as a tender, caring person. But as a pastor, you know what some things need in the church? They need to be handled like a, like a bruised reed and like a smoking flax where there's just barely any life left where that tomato plant got tipped over in the storm and the rain hit it too hard. And if you just pick that back up and you put a stick next to it and gingerly, tenderly tie that thing back together, you can still get some fruit off of that plant even though it's almost, almost worthless. And Paul says, I was among you, Thessalonians, and I cherished you like a nurse. Uh, to cherish means to harbor fondly, to cling to. There's some things in this life, in this Christian life, you should tenderly care for, you should give ease to, and you should harbor fondly and hold on to these things. The first thing I believe that a Christian should cherish is found in the verse. I believe the first thing you should cherish is the Word of God. Look in verse 33 again. These things have I what? Spoken. These things have I spoken. He spoke for four chapters here directly, and you should cherish the words of God. One day you're going to get to the place in your life where you'll have nothing left but this book. And the sooner you get to that place, the better. I don't wish it on anybody, but I wish it on everybody. <laughs> I don't desire that place, but it's a sweet place to be where the Lord brings you so low and the circumstances in life have your head bowed so far down that you can't even bear to look up. And the Lord says, are you going to turn to me yet? And the Lord brings you to that low place so that you have nowhere to look but up and look to him. You know where you find the Lord when you look up? You find him in the pages of this book. You find him in scripture. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Everybody memorized that when they were in Sunday school. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You say, how does this word give light? And how does this word like a lamp? This word shines just enough light in your life to show you the next step that you ought to take. Do not worry about what you're supposed to do in 20 years. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do in the next 10 years. When I was 18 years old, I had no idea what I was supposed to do in the next two years. I had no idea. I was in the middle of Bible school. I thought, I'm down here to learn the Bible. And then the Lord reminded me, I called you to preach before you went to Bible school. I said, oh yeah, oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> the Lord had called me uh, at a youth camp, at a Christian high school youth camp, and I surrendered to full-time Christian service to the Lord when I was uh, probably 17 years old. 
And I didn't even have that in my mind when I went down to Bible school. I just wanted to learn the Bible. And at 18 years old, I didn't know I would be moving to Alaska for eight years. I didn't know that I'd be getting ready for the ministry in a church there and learning the work of the ministry under somebody else and then moving here to Montana and getting my feet wet and jumping in and making all kinds of mistakes and moving all over the place. And the Lord finally said, I called you to Billings and I want you in Billings and this is where you're supposed to be. I didn't know that 20 years ago. You don't have to worry about what the Lord has for you 20 years down the road. A lamp and a light just shines enough light to see the next step in front of you. And when you take that and trust God, you need to cherish the Word of God. You say, how does that work? How does that work in my life when you take this Word of God and then you, it shows you how to go down the path of life? John Patton is a famous missionary. He went to the New Hebrides Islands. And he claimed a verse there in the Old Testament. I believe it's in the book of Psalms. It says, Ask of thee the heathen and I will give them thee for an inheritance. You know that verse is not talking about the New Hebrides Island heathen? And when John read across that page of Scripture, that verse was highlighted to him somehow, and it's like, if you've ever had this happen to you in reading Scripture, it's like the verse just like gets a little bigger. It's like the font size just changes just a tiny bit, or something. <laughs> Some of you are nodding your heads like, I, I've seen that, and some of you are like, you're crazy. Well, when you see it, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you read through Scripture and the Lord lifts the text off of the page and you say, is that verse for me? And the Lord says, that's the verse that answers the thing that you've been praying for and waiting for. There's an old hillbilly song that says, that thing that you've been praying for, it's on its way and it's paid for. And you're supposed to be thanking God. And sometimes in Scripture, the Lord reveals a verse to you just out of the blue. It can be out of Chronicles, it can be out of the Minor Prophets, or it can be in the Psalms. Everybody wants one from Psalms. But the Lord can use any passage in Scripture and give you some light on your path and some direction for today. Big decisions and little decisions. You need to cherish the Word of God. You know, I read some statistics on our Wednesday night class. We were talking about the Bible, where it came from how it came through the original manuscripts and we showed how it traveled down through Egypt and some scribes preserved it, copied it, and then it came down into the texts that we have today through Westcott and Hort and some other manuscripts. And then that was all the Greek side. Then we studied another path that traveled down through Antioch of Syria and some men copied it and preserved it and it came through uh, the Waldensians and the Luther uh, took it in, in German. And we studied those two lines of text, how we got our scriptures. And all through, that past, all through that lesson there, we studied how God preserved his words so that you would have his words today and how the devil has influenced the changing of God's words throughout history. You know what I cherish? I cherish this book right here. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In Psalm 12, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them unto this generation forever. Sometimes I get into a discussion with somebody about the Bible and they say, the Bible says this, and I say, you know, uh, it doesn't say that because uh, the verse doesn't say that and you quoted a different version of the Bible. How do we know which version is right? You know, I was talking this morning, I did, a friend of mine uh, was saying, he said, you know, the issue isn't there's all these versions and we can't know. The issue is if you said you have one version and this is right, I'd have some respect for you. But if you say all the versions are right, you have no Bible. I'm going to read you a famous preacher here. I, I read and use his illustrations all the time. But he said this. He said, all scripture is inspired by God, says the Bible. Someone says, what is inspiration? The word inspire or inspiration means God breathes or that God has breathed into this book and inspired it in a unique and miraculous way. Many people say, but there are different versions of the Bible. This definition of inspiration has been accepted by great fundamental scholars throughout many generations. Here's his definition. The Bible as we now have it, in its various translations and revisions, when freed from all errors and mistakes and translations, copyists and printers' errors, is the very Word of God and consequently holy without error. You know what he just said? He said, if you take all the versions of all the Bibles and you remove all the errors from all of them, we have the Scriptures. Well, who's going to do that? How are you going to have that? Is it so difficult to believe that God promised to preserve his words and that he did it? Is it so difficult? He promised to preserve him by purification seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You know why I can trust this book? Because I have God's words. Because I have God's words. 
I have 40 different versions on my shelf. I keep them all the way on the bottom shelf, stacked too deep on the shelf. I have 40 different versions back there, and they all differ between each other. And how am I supposed to know which one's right? How are you supposed to know which one's right? The Lord gave you a book. The Lord gave you a book you can trust, and you're going to come to the place in your life where you have nothing to trust but this book. David said, Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. You need to cherish this book and come to the place in your life where you rely on it. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord God, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You know why I need to cherish this book? Because it gives you an understanding of God. It gives you a confidence in the Lord. It gives you the character of God. How are you going to understand who God is if you don't spend any time in this book? I just remembered why I went on this rabbit trail. We were studying the two lines of manuscripts, and I found an article from the Wall Street Journal, and it said... It's 2011, it's been 400 years since the King James Bible was printed, and so they did a study on what people, what versions of the Bible people read, and they gave the statistics and the percentages of who reads what versions of the Bible, and they said, we know, what we found out conclusively from this study, we found out many things, what we found out conclusively is that people that read their Bible, 85% of people who read their Bible read a King James Bible. Do you know what I know statistically about you, whoever you are? Statistically. This doesn't mean 100%. Statistically, if you don't have a King James Bible, you don't read your Bible. Unless you're in the minimum. Unless you're in the 8 to 15%. These things have I spoken. How are you going to find out what God's speaking to you if you don't cherish His book? Number two, what things should you cherish? You should cherish God's presence. Verse 33, I love this one. These things have I spoken unto you that in me, in me, you might have peace. You know what I love? I love this book, and I love God's presence. When I found that out, that the Holy Spirit was sealed inside of me, maybe you should make a note. If you're taking notes, write down this reference just so you can find it someday. Ephesians 1, make sure I give you the right one. Ephesians 1, 13, and Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians 1, 13 in whom also ye trusted, that was your salvation. After that ye heard the word of truth, you heard that preached. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, what happened? Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You have God's presence with you, and you need to cherish God's presence. God's presence is in you, and He bears witness to the truth, and He speaks to you. It's in your passage in John 15, or John 16, <coughs> in verse 13. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. You can sit in a church service and not even know, uh, not even know the books of the Bible, and you have a Holy Spirit inside of you that says, that's the truth, that's for you. You can sit in a church service and have a preacher... Say something that's completely heretical, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of you will say, you better check that, you better study that out on your own. You say, well, I don't ever need to study the Bible. No, you are accountable because you're commanded to study the Bible. But if you don't know the Scriptures because you haven't grown in the Lord, you better listen and cherish the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Somebody came up to me after the wedding and corrected me. There's always one at every wedding. There's always one at every wedding. I, I don't really get it. I, I expect to hear something that I disagree with in any sermon I've ever heard, ever. Unless you're not paying attention. I hope that you didn't agree with every single line item thing that I said yesterday, because I hope that you have a brain, and that your brain was working, and you're like, I wouldn't say it that way. I don't quite agree with that. He could have said it better. I said things wrong that I know I said wrong, but because I'm nervous and in front of a bunch of new people, they didn't come out right. Uh, Jesus didn't die by this Roman stabbing his sword. Jesus gave up the ghost before that happened. But that's what I said, right? Somebody heard that? I don't even agree with everything I said. Do you have a Holy Spirit inside of you that can bear witness to the truth? <coughs> Somebody came up to me. It wasn't a racial issue. You know what I see in our world today? I see people making a racial issue out of all kinds of things. I think it needs preached, and I think I'm glad that I preached it, and I think it, was a racial, it wasn't It was a racial issue. The Jews and the Samaritans had the same father. They had the same father and different mothers. It takes two to tango. I don't know how you could make an issue out of that, but somebody thought that was necessary. 
you have a Holy Spirit inside of you to lead you and guide you into all truth? John 16, verse 13, that's his purpose. He will show you things to come. Not only does he show you the truth, he shows you things that are coming in the future. Every Christian today has this, this, little, this little buzz, this little feeling, this little warm warming of, I don't know how to explain it. It's just this little sensation, just real minor, that something's changing in this world and it isn't going to be good. And we're all wondering, how bad is it going to get before we get out of here? How bad is it going to look? Are we going to go through some really bad testing? Are we going to go through some really bad trial? You know what you have, no matter what happens? You have the Holy Spirit's presence inside of you, witnessing and bearing witness to the truth. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. And if it gets really, really bad, take no thought what you shall say. In that hour, or in that moment, the Lord is going to give you the words to speak. That's the Holy Spirit's presence inside of you. Do you cherish the Holy Spirit's presence? You know what Jesus did when, with the disciples? He took them out on a boat one day in Matthew chapter 8. And he was exhausted. He's exhausted from the mountains. He's exhausted from the miracles. He's exhausted from the work of the ministry. And he's exhausted with the religious minutia of his day. Jesus falls asleep in the boat. And the storm comes up, just like every time we read about a boat in Galilee. A storm comes up, and Jesus is in the boat, and he's fast asleep in the midst of the storm. A clear conscience sleeps in a hurricane. Jesus had the clearest conscience of any man who ever walked this earth. He's fast asleep there in the boat. The disciples are bailing water. They wake him up and say, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? Pause. Perish? With Jesus in the boat. You know, Martha and Mary had more sense than that when Lazarus died. Martha walks up to, to Jesus on his way there. Remember, he waits for Lazarus to die, and he shows up, and she says, which one said it, Martha or Mary? I think it was Martha. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. You know what Martha knew? It was very common knowledge back then that the disciples forgot in the moment you couldn't die in Jesus' presence. That's why Jesus had to die first on the cross, because the, nobody could die in his presence, and the thief and the other uh, murderer, they just had to wait their turn. Jesus couldn't allow anybody to die in his presence, not one time in scripture. You know what you have in the presence of God? You have a sweet spot where nothing can happen to you unless the Lord allows it to happen. You know, in some sense, you are invincible as a Christian. You say, I'm going to go on the highway and drive 150 miles an hour. You might die and rip your head off underneath the semi. Don't do that. You know, if you're in the will of the Lord and you're doing what the Lord wants you to do and you're listening to the leading of the Lord and following his voice, nothing can happen to you. You are invincible until God says your time is up. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. You say, Isaac, are you worried about dying? Not until the Lord's ready for me to. It doesn't bother me. I'm ready to go any time. And I don't think I can die until the Lord sets, sets the appointment. And I don't know when that appointment is, but... It's just not for me to worry about. That's on his schedule. I have the presence of God. It's a sweet thing that I cherish. You know, when you find God's presence, you get saved and he's in you. When you find God's presence, you go where, he, where the Lord is and you want to be around his presence. Have you heard somebody say in a prayer, Lord, we just want you to be with us? All right? Lord, we want you to be with you. He's with you everywhere you go if you're saved. But what do we mean when we say that prayer? That prayer has some meaning to it. It has some substance to it. We mean we want to have God manifest himself and show himself and reveal himself and work in our midst. Lord, please be with us. Be with us in a working way. Somebody asked me yesterday, how do I feel saved? How do I feel saved? Um, brother, I didn't give you a very good answer. How do you feel saved? But it's written all over your face. <laughs> Again, it's written all over your face. You look, you, you come in burdened with sin and you ask the Lord to save you. You put your trust in Him. I've seen it, I don't know how many times, probably a hundred times. You look up from praying and you're like, am I standing in front of the same person? Where'd the other guy go? There's something all over your face. It's called your countenance in the Bible and it changed and there's a brightness, there's a boldness to it. You know what Jesus says? If you want to experience His presence, He says you listen for a still small voice. One of the old preachers said you can almost hear it over the TV. You listen to God's still, small voice. You know how you hear God's still, small voice? Jesus took the blind man and he said, I want to heal you, blind man, but first we want to get out of town. And he took him out of town, and he took him off of the path, and he got him to a quiet place away from the bustle and the hustle and away from the traffic, and he got him in a quiet place, and then he began to work with that man, and he gave him his sight, and his eyesight was restored. 
You know where you meet with God? You say, I want an experience with God. You'll have to get in a quiet place. An experience with God will not happen with the music in your car and the TV on at your house and the YouTube videos till 1 in the morning. You are not going to experience God until you get yourself in a quiet place. Where do you meet with God? You meet Him early in the morning and you meet Him late in the day. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's how it happens in Scripture over and over and over. There's a special time early in the morning when everybody else is sleeping and everything is quiet. There's a special time in the evening when the sun goes down and everything is quiet. Early and late in the day. Early will I seek thee, David said. You need to cherish God's presence. Number three, you need to cherish God's sorrow. Look at John 16, 33 again, the middle of the verse. In the world, this is a promise, this is a guarantee. In the world ye shall have tribulation. That's for the disciples, that's for the apostles, that's for every Christian who ever lived until the great tribulation starts, in the world you shall have tribulation. Sometimes the Bible talks about a time period of tribulation, those seven years, Daniel's 70th week and all that. And sometimes, sometimes it's just regular old troubles that come up in everybody's life. But the title of my message is Things You Should Cherish. You say, I should cherish tribulation? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I glory in mine infirmities. I glory in those things. Sometimes you read Paul and you wonder if he's just talking, or if he's insane, or if he's just super spiritual and trying to put a guilt trip on you. But you have to take it as inspired from the Lord. And Paul says, I glory in my infirmities. How could Paul glory in his infirmities? How could he say that with a straight face, clear conscience, and be telling you the truth? In that same passage, Paul got a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. And he asked God to take it away, and God wouldn't take it away. And he asked God to take it away again, and he asked him again, and he wouldn't take it away. And sometimes, when the Lord reveals his glory to a Christian, the Lord will bring some trouble with it, and you should glory in your infirmities. You know why Paul gloried in that thing? Paul gloried in that thing because he got a taste of the power of God. He saw revelations in the flesh that no other man had ever seen. He saw something about the presence of God. It looks like he saw the inner workings of the third heaven where you and I are going to go and see a mansion someday. Paul saw some supernatural things and the Lord said, You know what? If you suffer for me, you're going to reign with me. And the suffering brings a reward. And Paul says, I glory in it. I glory in getting a hold of this idea that this world is temporary and that eternity is eternity. I don't know how to get you to that place. Got too many friends on Facebook. Got too many toys in your garage. Got too many hobbies that you're working on. Too many side jobs. How do you get this world to be temporary and get the eternal things to have the weight and the relevance that they have for eternity? How do you get somebody to think that way? Paul says he's going to put you through some suffering. Jesus said in chapter 16, the beginning of the chapter, Don't be offended. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. You know, when you have the Word of God and the presence of God, don't be offended when you have a trial from God. The Lord will bring trials into your life, and there's no... Where's my quote? One soul walked this earth without sin, but none without sorrow. Jesus had to go through sorrow. And our flesh just has this this squirmy way of trying to create an environment where there's no troubles. I just don't want any trouble. I just don't want any problems. I just want security. Somebody said, there is no such thing as security. There's only opportunities. You cannot have security. You say, I'm going to have a retirement. It's going to be fixed. And it's going to be set. It's only secure as the guy that holds the bag. <laughs> if that guy's honest and holds your retirement in honesty, then you might have a retirement. And if you work for Magnavox in 1988, you or 1998, you do not have a retirement. <laughs> My friend's dad lost everything. Why? Because he valued security. He valued the security of this world that wasn't as secure as he thought it was. And last time I knew him, he was still pushing a broom. You know where I, my, I find my security? I find my security in the Word of God, in the presence of God, and I'm required to cherish the tribulations and the sorrows that God puts me through. Maybe that won't be your trial, the financial things. Maybe it'll be something else with family. Maybe it'll be something else with health. There's all kinds of things that the Lord puts different Christians through, and He expects them to consider this world as temporary and the eternal things as eternal. And the eternal things as a weight of glory, of importance. I'm just skipping all kinds of notes here. How about number four? 
Lastly, what should a Christian cherish? Number four, look at the verse again. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I, I have overcome the world. The last thing I believe that you should cherish, there's a number of other things I'm sure you could preach on. The last thing I believe you should cherish in this text is you should cherish Jesus Christ's example. Jesus Christ set the perfect example. My preacher is known for saying, you can find something wrong with me, and you can find something wrong with my church, and you can find something wrong with my people, but what can you find wrong with Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ came to this earth. He was born of sinful parents, but he lived a sinless life. He was raised among brethren who didn't get along with him. They didn't get along with him for the beginning of his life. And imagine being Jesus Christ's sibling. Everything that was ever wrong in that house was not his fault. <laughs> That'd be a tough way to grow up. His brethren show up one day to a Bible study, and they can't even get in the door. Jesus is having this Bible study, and they said they could not come at him for the press. In that same story, you know somebody got through and got healed? but his family couldn't get through? Why couldn't the family, the inner circle, I mean, they got special privileges when you're family, right? You get to sit up front. And you get the, these privileges in life, right? How come his own family couldn't get through to a Bible study? The only thing I can figure is they just didn't want it bad enough. And Jesus was there in that house ministering to the people who wanted to, got in there and found a way. You know, Jesus Christ was, he was the perfect sinless man and he had the perfect example. You have some pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. We talked about Isaac yesterday. Moses is a type of Jesus Christ. He was hidden at birth. Moses was hidden so he wouldn't be killed. Jesus Christ was hidden and taken down to Egypt so he wouldn't be killed by Herod. Now they tried to kill him. He was rejected of his own people. Moses was rejected by his own people. And Jesus came unto his own. His own received him not. Moses had a Gentile bride there. You only know that because Miriam and Aaron got upset about it. Moses had a Gentile bride there. And who's Jesus Christ's bride? He's lost heathen, pagan, outside of the Jews, would spit on your New Testament if you tried to open it up and show it to him today. And Jesus Christ has a Gentile bride. Jesus Christ, or Moses, was a shepherd in Exodus chapter 3, and Jesus Christ says, I'm the good shepherd in John 10. Moses was accepted by his own people the second time, and Jesus will be accepted by his people the second time. After that time of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, then the Lord's going to come back and they're going to have their eyes open and the veil will be taken away from over their heart and then they're going to see Jesus Christ and when they see Jesus Christ, they'll accept him. God said that he'd be with Moses in, Gen in Exodus 3 and God said he'd be with Jesus Christ over and over in the book of John. Moses had the signs and Jesus had the miracles, but Moses loses the example of Jesus Christ at one point in his life. At one point in his life, the Lord says, Moses, I want you to smite that rock, and Moses smites the rock. And the Lord says, Moses, I want you this time to speak to the rock. You got water last time by smiting the rock, I want you to speak to the rock. And what does he do? How dare you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Crack! <laughs> You're supposed to speak, Moses, not smite. And Moses, you messed up a picture. The Lord had a beautiful picture in that rock. The rock is Jesus Christ too, right? And the rock got smitten and Jesus was crucified on the cross, but you don't smite Jesus Christ again and you don't take his transubstantiated body every week and put it in your mouth every week and crucify the Son of God afresh. You know what you do after you smite the rock one time, after he's smitten for your sins? You speak to the rock. And the Lord said, Moses, that was a really, really important picture there that you messed up. You're not going in the promised land. He had a problem with speaking. Remember when he first showed up, the Lord said, I want you to speak for me. He said, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore. I can't even speak very good. And God said, oh, okay, I'll bring Aaron in to speak for you. You know what Jesus Christ said in John 8? He said, I speak the things which I have heard of him. You know what Jesus said in John chapter 12? Even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Moses was a good example, but Jesus was the perfect example. You know, you need to find a good example in this life that you can follow. Brother Lester Roloff, uh, he died the year I was born, 1982. And Lester Roloff ran a boys' reclamation ranch in Texas. He would take men and boys. He had a men's home, boys' home, women's home, girls' home, all separate, some of them on islands out there in the coastal area. 
uh, he would take people from all over the country when he could fit them into his place and he'd preach to them and they'd hear preaching on the radio and they'd hear Bible from morning to night and he'd put them to work and they grew their own food and raised their own animals and milked their own things, whatever, goats, chickens, whatever they milked. <laughs> they, are, they are not completely self-sufficient, but he went to churches all over the country. And one of the things he would say is, if you're a new Christian in the Lord, you can borrow some of my standards. You can borrow some of my standards and my example for a time, but you're going to come to the age where you have to get your own. You know, you need to find a good example, but the perfect example is Jesus Christ. And until you understand who Jesus Christ is, you're going to need some examples in this Christian life to follow. You know, there's a man in the New Testament named Stephen, and Stephen, his enemies wouldn't answer him. In Acts chapter 7, he had false witnesses hired against him. In Acts chapter 6, he was accused of blasphemy. This man's full of the Spirit of the Lord, and people accused him of being full of the devil. He's accused of blasphemy. He's accused of destroying the temple and breaking the law. And he had the same high priest that Jesus Christ had in Acts chapter 7. He had the same petition at his death as Jesus Christ, the same request. Jesus said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lay not this sin to their charge. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. You know, Stephen was a really good example. He said almost word for word the same thing Jesus Christ said at a death where he was being murdered. And you know what Stephen mixed up? Stephen said, Lord, receive my spirit and also forgive them. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, forgive them. Father, receive my spirit. You know who the perfect example is? It's Jesus Christ. Stephen had a, just a little backwards. He had himself first, but you have a perfect example, Jesus Christ. You say, I've known some Christians that have wronged me. I've had some parents that were a bad example. I've had some family and friends and some religious people that I looked up to, and they led me astray. You know who you have as a perfect example to take away all your excuses? You have the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have his life and his testimony of four people that walked and witnessed everything that he did. You have this in the pages of a book, and you need to know who Jesus Christ is and what his example is. If a great man, the Apostle Paul, we go through his list as well. We go through how the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. He preached in the synagogues. The Jews tried to kill him. He preached boldly again. He tried to kill him again. He preached publicly. Then people asked him to leave. He gave signs and wonders. He's filled with joy. All these things are found in the book of John. He was brought before a high priest, and when they smote Paul on the mouth, you remember what he said? God smite thee, thou whited wall. <laughs> remember that? That priest found the edge, the outer limit of Paul's tolerance right there. You know, when Jesus was reproached and reviled, he reviled not again. You have some great examples in Scripture. I mean, how can you hold yourself up to, to Moses? He's just a great example. How can you compare yourself to the Apostle Paul? Paul said, be ye followers of me. Who? All of Christianity, Paul. Be ye followers of me, even as I'm a follower of Christ. That's a, that's a bold statement. I think I'd be intimidated if I met the Apostle Paul. Paul wasn't perfect. God smite thee, thou whited wool. That ever come out of your heart? <laughs> Didn't come out of Jesus' heart. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ's example? Do you cherish his word? I hope you cherish his word. I hope you read his word. I hope you love his word. I love this book. I love the book when I understand it, and I love it when I don't understand it. I love it when I'm mad at God, and I love it when I'm just in the sweet mountaintop experience presence of God. The Lord always pushes me back to that book and says, uh, I've been so discouraged before. I say, Lord, am, am, what am I even doing? Am I even supposed to be doing this? There's other churches in this town. There's plenty of other guys, and I run through the list say, do you want me to go to this guy's church? This is five, six, seven years ago. Why am I trying to start my own thing? I just can't get along with anybody. Is that what's going on, Lord? I will submit myself to anybody in this place that you lead me to, and I'm willing to go there. Where would you have me go, Lord? The Lord says, get your Sunday school lesson ready for tomorrow. And I open the pages of Scripture, whatever lesson it is, and I say, Lord, I don't even want to do this. Things are not going my way, <laughs> is what I'm basically saying. I don't use those words, though. That doesn't sound very good. 
And I start reading. I remember reading the book of Ecclesiastes one time, and the Lord just opened up the whole chapter and said, that's you, that's your problem. Solomon went through that 3,000 years ago, and there's nothing new under the sun. Get your lesson ready for tomorrow. Do you cherish God's word? There's going to come a time in your life where that's all you have. It's the only physical thing you can put your hands on. That's what helps me live by faith. You cherish God's presence. Holy Spirit's inside of you, sealed until the day of redemption, and He can't leave, and so the Scripture says, don't grieve Him. He's stuck there. If He could leave, He wouldn't be grieved. <laughs> See, if I sin, what if I sin? Will I lose my salvation? He's sealed until the day of redemption. That's His terms, not your terms. You already accepted His terms of salvation. You cherish God's sorrows and the troubles that God brings in your life. In this world, you shall have tribulation. You need to learn to cherish those. Do you cherish Jesus Christ's example? He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You have a permanent example in Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Let's stand and pray. We'll be dismissed with one verse of a song. Lord, I thank you for today. And I thank you for the examples of the other men in Scripture. Lord, we compare ourselves to them all the time. We find their troubles and we find their sorrows and we find their joys and their experiences. And their interactions with other people and their comfort and encouragement to us, Lord. But I thank you for your example. You never sinned one time. You left us a perfect example that we can follow you and that we can trust you. Lord, I ask that you please bless this morning. I ask you please help some people to cherish those things. If there's something they were lacking, Lord, I ask that this message would have called attention to it and they'd remember just the thing today that you wanted to speak to them about. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What have you got? All right, let's try number 463 in the blue book. 463. 463, we'll just sing the first verse. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus?